All right, land development code. So I'm going to call up uh, Nick Baudet and Brent Lloyd, Mayor and Council. This is a. Are you going to be giving us a memo following this that tracks the other one? Yes. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Um, Nick and Brent are here to uh, talk about the supplemental staff reports that were issued on October 25th and November 25th, as well as talk about next steps. Um, as you all know, the Planning Commission has convened multiple times, um, including this evening. Um, and so we're here to talk about what the next steps would be after the Planning Commission completes its work. Uh, good morning, Anique Baudet here with Brent Lloyd, and we also have members of, um, of our leadership team here um, for Q&A should, should there need um, to be folks brought up. Um, the focus of the briefing uh, this morning is going to be to focus on the elements uh, of the October 25th supplemental report and also talk about um, elements forthcoming in uh, a second supplemental report that we are aiming for November 25th. Um, I'll start by saying I can't emphasize enough um, our continued refinement of the draft that was released on October 4th um, with regards to what we've learned um, through community engagement, uh, meetings with mayor and council, and um, from the Planning Commission deliberations that have been going on um, over the last week. So I'll start by uh, going over our timeline, which has been uh, substantial. In October, we've had uh, multiple one-on-ones with the community through office hours. We've attended council member um, hosted uh, town halls, which have been fantastic engagement opportunities, as well as open houses hosted um, by the team. There were also several milestones, significant milestones in October. Um, the Planning Commission held their public hearing, and staff also uh, published a full report card on the performance of the October 4th uh, draft of the code. And again, can't emphasize enough the continued refinement um, and ideas and testing that staff is doing based on input um, and reaction to the October 4th draft uh, and map. I do want to highlight um, themes that came from the Planning Commission public hearing, which was all day on a Saturday here at City Hall. Uh, there were concerns we heard about property taxes, about affordability, about um, further work we could do for looking at how the code and the maps might affect areas vulnerable to gentrification and displacement. Um, we heard um, concerns about trees, about flooding, and about infrastructure needs in general, and how those will coincide and work um, with the code. Uh, we also heard um, concerns about changes to neighborhoods and um, some misunderstandings on how the re regulations might work, which is doing a lot to inform our messaging and how we're talking about what we're doing. And so I really appreciate October being very iterative um, and helping us really listen to the community and understand how we can do better and how we explain what it is um, that the code is doing because it's so comprehensive and touches so many things. So with that, um, we're going to focus on now walking through the elements of the October 25th, and I'm going to pass it over to Brent to start that conversation. Supplemental. Thanks, uh, Brent Lloyd uh, with the LDC leadership team. And um, as Anique said, we're going to go ahead and walk through the um, October 25th staff supplemental staff report. And this is the first of what we envision to be um, a few supplementals where we communicate to council and the commission and the community um, the feedback re we've received and the kinds of changes that we're proposing to the draft code. Um, and the October 25th report supplemental was our, was our first one. So we'll just kind of walk through the highlights of that. Um, the first, I think, important section of the report um, is part one, which is text and map changes. And these are really a, a combination of, of changes that are ones that are fairly specific and clear and are, um, I think, stated with 
sufficient precision to be actionable at first reading. So if council were to incorporate these changes, um, they would provide sufficient direction for staff um, at second reading to incorporate. And in particular, the text changes are at pages three through nine of the report. And these are all changes that range from clarifications, corrections, to um, minor substantive changes. Um, uh, they're, they're all more than typos, um, but they're not uh, earth changing and they're well within the, the scope of issues that we've been discussing with council. Some highlights include um, changes in, you know, in response to feedback from the community and as well as internal review. And um, examples include the elimination of type three STRs in transition areas, um, some further provisions that we propose to strengthen uh, consideration of wildfire issues during development review. That was a, a comment that we've heard consistently. Um, the removal of the Save Our Springs amendments and the deferral of those to a later process, which we've discussed previously with council, that's in here. The elimination of the exemption for demo permits for interior demolitions. So there's a handful of changes from corrections, clarifications to substantive changes. Uh, that are at pages three through nine of the report, and we're happy to answer questions on those. Additionally, we've provided um, map corrections, and those are linked uh, in the report to a document that's available online. And these, this document is meant to um, really uh, identify technical corrections, um, as well as corrections related to the former Title 25 zoning district. Um, and the bulk of these corrections um, really pertain to situations where um, lots were not mapped with the appropriate zone because of lot size. We don't, you know, we don't want to create substandard lots. We don't want to map lots with zones that would immediately render the lots too small for the zone. And we definitely found instances where that occurred. And so we've gone through and tried to correct those and that's a fluid document and we'll continue to make changes to that as they are identified. Uh, additionally, um, more substantively, the report highlights um, proposed changes to the map that would be substantive in nature, really changes to the criteria that staff uh, used in preparing the draft map that was released in October. And these changes are described, um, I think, fairly clearly, but they're not yet actionable. And we intend uh, on November 25th to release a second, second supplemental where we, where we will flesh out um, exactly the type of criteria that we're envisioning proposing with respect to these changes. And specifically, um, the kinds of changes that we're proposing have to do with um, the residential corridor transition areas. I think that's the biggest one. We have signaled in, in our October 25th report that we believe, based on feedback from the community, that some reduction in the transition areas along residential corridors is appropriate. And that um, includes residential corridors in all parts of town, um, particularly those uh, where, that are identified as the most susceptible to gentrification, based on the UT up, uprooted report, as well as other, other streets that are principally residential in character, but are listed as corridors in our transportation plan. Um, also related to that um, is bolstering um, opportunities for missing middle housing and high opportunity areas. Um, and this was part of council's direction. And I think it was, it, it proved difficult to develop criteria consistent with sort of the general transition area mapping criteria because of corridors are not distributed equally all over the city, um, but we are committed based on feedback um, to proposing criteria that would allow for greater opportunities for high opportunity, for missing middle housing in high opportunity areas. So that's part one of the report, um, and we look forward on November 25th to following up with additional detail, uh, as I mentioned, on those, those substantive mapping changes. Um, part two of the report, is additional provisions, and these are provisions uh, that are attached as appendices to the report. Um, and the first one is a proposed amendment to the Imagine Austin Comprehensive Plan, and we have a map that we can that we can present. 
And this, uh, the goal of this of this change is really to provide a firm foundation in uh, in Imagine Austin for the transition areas. And so the it includes a map with accompanying text that describes the transition areas and and gives them a firm nexus to the growth concept map of Imagine Austin, which is a citywide enactment. Um, and additionally, the accompanying text that describes the proposed amendment affirms the importance of small area plans and neighborhood plans going forward. And specifically, it states that any extension of transition area boundaries beyond what's shown uh, on the map, which is meant to be concurrent with the draft zoning map for transition areas, that any extension of the transition areas would be subject to the FLUM amendment process uh, for neighborhood plans, including contact team review. And those provisions are all carried forward uh, in the draft land development code. And additionally, um, the amendment, the draft text for the amendment describes that if somebody were to propose a change within the transition areas, that would be, for example, a neighborhood commercial use um, consistent with what's allowed under the, the mixed use one and two, um, that too would require a FLUM amendment. The, the, the map that's proposed for the comprehensive plan is really just to ensure authorization for the, the multi-unit residential within the transition areas. And in all other respects, applicable area FLUMs and amendment procedures would apply. So the additional, uh, the second um, new provision that is proposed in the staff report is attached as Appendix B, and that is uh, some draft revisions to the sign code. And those have to do with prior initiation from the council related to uh, right-of-way installation, off-premise advertising, as well as off-premise advertising for schools. And I'm not prepared to talk, talk about those at length today, but it is essentially um, items that council initiated uh, last year and I think followed up on earlier this year and they would provide limited allowances for off-premise advertising um, in the circumstances uh, that I mentioned. Um, and finally, the last section of the report is um, items for further consideration. Um, and in this part of the report, we basically just identify provisions that are changes that we anticipate proposing that are not yet fully developed or certainly not actionable, but they're, they're ones that we we're confident we're gonna be proposing additional changes to. And that includes some modifications to the, um, to the missing, middle, um, missing middle housing regulations, um, the site development standards for the transition areas, as well as changes to the um, um, preservation incentive um, and I think there are a handful of other, other changes that are mentioned in that section of the report. And we anticipate uh, for at least some of those coming forward in the November 25th second supplemental with some additional um, refinement um, that would actually make those changes concrete. Um, so that is essentially the sort of layout and content of the October 25th report. I think the one thing I forgot to mention is we're very cognizant of typographical errors and corrections as one would expect in a document of this size. We've, we've identified some and so we've, we've um, rather than sort of list those voluminously in the report itself, we provided a link to a document that we're continuing to update that lists uh, typographical errors and minor wording changes and we anticipate um, that that document will continue to be updated going forward and hopefully uh, in advance of first reading, we'll have a fairly thorough and comprehensive, reasonably comprehensive um, identification of those errors. Um, so as I mentioned, on uh, November 25th, we will be providing a second supplemental report. And that report will include follow through on the October 25th report. It will um, include a more specific description of the revised mapping criteria with respect to residential corridors. It'll include um, more specific um, descriptions of the proposed changes that we're suggesting with respect to site development standards. And additionally, we continue um, to review comments that are coming in. So I think it is possible 
likely that we will be proposing some additional edits based on ongoing feedback that we're receiving from the community, a variety of stakeholders. Um, the other thing that I will mention as well is that um, expectation is that tonight the Planning Commission will wrap up their work and vote on a final report to Council and we will be taking their various recommendations and putting them into uh, a readable spreadsheet for Council and we'll be providing that I think on um, November 18th along with um, a short summary of staff's position with respect to those recommendations and that will that will essentially be whether we support our neutral um, oppose or partially agree with those recommendations um, I think in the, in the supplemental report that will come out on November 25th, we may provide some additional context and clarification for staff's position on the Planning Commission recommendations, but we are committed by November 18th to providing you with a full report of the Commission's recommendations. Um, and so with that, I'll turn it back over to Anik, and I think then we'll be available to answer questions. Me. Our next steps, as Brent mentioned, um, November 18th will be the Planning Commission report that we will assist in compiling and, and forwarding to you all um, with our comments. And then November 25th, Supplemental Staff Report number two that will go into more detail um, of the things we signaled October 25th that we are making changing, changes to our own criteria based on feedback and um, from the community and Planning Commission and meeting with Mayor and Council. Uh, Council is posted uh, for public hearing on December 7th. I know there's work sessions early in December as well scheduled. And then first ordinance reading is scheduled for December 9th. And then I will add that tomorrow we will be forwarding you all um, community maps that were submitted during on our October uh, uh, public engagement month um, by district. We received about 52 community maps um, through that process. And so we'll be forwarding those hard copies to y'all with some comment, and then we will send um, an email to mayor and council um, summarizing the themes that we saw uh, amongst the maps. So that will be tomorrow. And with that, uh, we're happy to answer uh, questions on the supplemental or any other parts of the project. Thank you for your attention. So during October, uh, we created an opportunity for individuals or neighborhood associations, organizations, anyone really in the community to download. We had the new zoning map by district. We had um, all the districts cut into quarters that um, the new zoning map could be printed. And we had a cover sheet that outlined some parameters that were within the guideposts of council's direction from May 2nd. Um, because folks were asking for an opportunity to, or an outlet to give feedback on the mapping that we did uh, of the new zones. And so that was, our, uh, that was our way of being able to collect information that folks really wanted to give us okay. with regards to the mapping. And so they came in all different shapes. Some were just really changes to small areas within um, a district. Some were a little bit more expansive. Okay. So those were, those were, but they were, they were maps created by our staff with comments by other people? Yeah, they were, they were the zoning map that was out on October 4th that was then um, either digitally modified or physically written on by the community. Say, change this, I don't like this, change this to a different zoning, move these around, I don't like any of this, those kind of comments specifically on the map. Okay, and you said you're gonna, those will be made public when? We're gonna deliver those um, by district mm -hmm. to you all tomorrow Okay. with the cover sheets of our marks on how well they met or didn't meet the council direction um, per our opinion, uh, and then we'll summarize uh, what kind type of comments um, in an email to you all as well. Do you know now, like, of the 52, where most of them came from? Ooh, I'd have to from ask Greg. Come up. If you can remember, Greg and his team have been looking through most of them over the last week. Uh, Greg Dutton, Planning and Zoning. 
I actually am not sure district wise where most of them came from. Okay. Um, but we will, we're going to break them out by district. So we'll, we will know. We just don't know at this point. Okay. You can, can in your memo you provide a chart that says? Yes. Okay. Um, and then, oh, wh what were you, wh why did you bring this up? I'm sorry. Did I miss? You were just talking about the transition zones. Um, we uh, brought it up. We brought it. There. <laughs> We, uh, we brought it up because it's an it's a important part of the supplemental, the October 25th supplemental, and, it's un, and if I didn't describe it clearly enough, I apologize. It's a proposed amendment to Imagine Austin that would essentially show the transition areas as part of the growth concept map series. Got it. And it would ensure a solid foundation for council's action with respect to transition areas in Imagine Austin, and it would also, as I mentioned, affirm the ongoing significance of small area and neighborhood plans with respect to area, certain kinds of zoning changes within transition areas as well as changes outside of the transition areas. Does having it as an amendment to Imagine Austin create some different process than what we're on track for now? We're, we've posted, the amendment was posted before Planning Commission um, and it's, it's following the required process concurrent with the Land Development Code Amendment um, the re process required for amendments to Imagine Austin. Okay, and then lastly, um, I believe last time you, somebody said that the transition zones are about 2% of, of, our, of our cities, um, and you said that you were also going to be able to break it down by watershed. Have you been able to do that part of it, of the transition zones, like of the different watersheds, um, what percentage of the watershed there are? And if not, can, can you do that? We can, haven't done it, can okay. do it. Thank you. We'll do it. Thank you. Uh, Paige. Thank you all for the work that you're doing on this. I know um, it was such a hit in my district and people were able to get their good questions answered. So um, I have another community event Q&A happening on November 19th for District 8. Um, so I appreciate y'all willing to be a part of that and to continue answering questions for my constituents along the way. Um, one of the topics that came up commonly was about private deed restrictions. Can you talk a little bit about um, are those things that the city rights, that the city enforces? Um, you know, how, how do those work in neighborhoods? Sure, I'll, I'll state just generally what I think what, what has been said publicly on it. Um, I'm drawing on legal information that's been shared with the community and, and we have our law department as well uh, to expand on that. But essentially, um, private deed restrictions are enforceable by the private parties to the deed restrictions. The city does not and cannot enforce them, either in the form of you know, proactively bringing legal action or in withholding development permits based on deed restrictions. So if a development permit, um, if a development permit complies with the city regulations, the city has an obligation to issue that permit notwithstanding whether or not it complies with private restrictions. Um, the city has recently made some amendments to the residential development application to really do a better job of letting landowners know that they need to be aware of their deed restrictions. Um, so it's something that we're committed to in that respect to making sure that information is available and landowners know that they need to take care of that on their own but it's not something the city can enforce. There are very limited ways in which certain kinds of private deed restrictions affect the notice that's required for certain types of subdivisions. Um, but other than that, um, the city does not have a role in enforcing private deed restrictions. And so if there was some conflict between the zoning and the private deed restriction that's actively being enforced, which one would prevail in, in that particular circumstance? So people can agree privately to not do something that they're allowed to do by law. And so in a private action where deed restrictions, private deed restrictions are enforced, um, people can be ordered by a court not to pursue uh, development that otherwise would be permitted under city regulation. They're really two separate types of regulation. I appreciate that. Um, and so any change in zoning that happens during this land development code update, those private 
actively enforced deed restrictions would, would still be in place in those communities that have them agreed to. Um, is, is there any, um, are there any other community goals like, you know, affecting climate change for the positive, um, housing goals, mobility goals, or equity goals that um, could be affected by deed restrictions? Like, can we meet our housing goals? Council Member Page, I, I um, or Council Member Ellis, I know that there's a lot of discussion about deed restrictions in the community, but I think, um, I don't think we're prepared to, to weigh in at a policy level on all the different types of deed restrictions and what their impacts are. Thanks. Can I ask a follow-up on deed restrictions? Go ahead, deed restrictions. Um, as, a, as a practical matter, deed restrictions are also reviewed when property is sold. So if you had a property that didn't comply with this deed restriction and then you tried to sell it to another party, that would cause a problem with your title transfer or other parts of that transaction, I would imagine. So there is kind of a practical reality to the deed restrictions that if somebody decides that they want to violate the deed restriction and they tear a house down and they put up a triplex, they're going to sell it. That was kind of the point of them going through that exercise, but they won't be able to sell it because it won't comply with the deed restriction. They'll run into title issues. So I think that's something that, that we've been talking about or, or thought about most recently in terms of not every deed restriction gets enforced through a costly lawsuit. There is some real practical market forces that keep deed restrictions <coughs> as an enforceable document. Okay. Leslie. Thanks for the additional work. I wanted to follow up on the, um, the draft transition zone map that, that you all offered. And I wanted to find out how this aligns with Imagine Austin and the direction that was set out in Imagine Austin for where regional centers and town centers would be and also um, our transit corridors. I think under state law, our zoning code is required to align with the comprehensive plan. So could you all give us a, a, a map that does that overlay? I think I've asked for that before. That'd be great. Yeah. So I'll start with, uh, so this map is meant to supplement Imagine Austin Chapter 4, which goes through our um, vision for our growth concept for the city, which includes, as you mentioned, our center's concept. Um, leading up to Chapter 4 is our um, priorities, um, one being compact and connected. And there's a lot of um, discussion and policy discussion within Imagine Austin about um, land use and transportation and the nexus between land use and transportation. And so this map is meant to be inserted in the series that lead up to the comprehensive growth concept to include in our growth concept a visual of um, the concept of transition areas, which is spoken to a bit throughout. And we can, um, we're in the process of, of putting together um, a complete roadmap, so to speak, of how all the regulating plans, neighborhood plans, Imagine Austin policies work together. Um, I think that would be really helpful, and you have asked for that in the past, and so right. we have that s sketched out and should be out in a week or so. Yeah, because I don't know how we can vote to amend uh, Imagine Austin by putting this in here until we know how it aligns with what the comprehensive plan says in the first place so that we can see where the alignments exist or where there may be variations and then we can have a, a better informed um, uh, map, literally map of where we may or may not agree with that. Um, so that's great and thank you for that and I hope we can get that fairly quickly. Um, and then I, I had asked previously about the 2%, the distribution of the 2% uh, uh, trans transition zones by district. Um, I know that we are saying to the general population in our city that it's 2% of what exists and one of the questions that I submitted to the Q&A gave the calculation which was the number of acres which was like 3,400 3, acres. I can't remember what the numbers were and then the number of these that were um, the number of acres in the transition zones was indeed uh, a little less than 2%. But what that doesn't say is what is the direct impact by district, which is really what people are talking about. And, and this map, to the extent that it's helpful, actually does show 
where the transition zone impact is occurring and it is roughly in the central core of the city and I think that is that is in fact what people are most concerned about um, so if you could also along with the alignment with the comprehensive plan give us the breakdown of the number of acres by uh, by districts that would be helpful and I, there's probably some more fine-tuning and and detail work that that would be helpful that you all know would help us um, because you're working much more intimately with these maps and I would urge you to bring that information to us as well don't wait for us to say, well, we need this additional detail because all of a sudden we just realized that we don't understand this piece because we haven't asked for these four subsets of data. So if you all could use that initiative and help, and help us understand uh, what it is we're looking at. Um, and if it means uh, one-on-ones in the various offices, that would be really great. But the map does show what the community is, is deeply concerned about, which is much of the change is happening in the central core of the city, which is where the land is the most expensive. And it is also where it's the most scarce. Um, so if we can get those numbers broken down, then we'll be able to, um, we'll be able to have a more informed conversation with the residents who really need to be okay with what we're doing. I, I really, and, I'm, and I want to emphasize that, I want to make sure that the community is okay with what we're doing here. And that means we have to provide a lot of information. We have to do it in a way that's easily communicated. Um, and we have to take the time to answer their questions that, because they deserve that. Um, I think it was Delia who also asked for the, the breakdown in the watersheds. Um, I think I had asked for that previously as well, so that would also be very helpful. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, and then there are some other issues related to our work in December. Um, I had a, a conversation with the city manager about some additional issues that, that are just pending, but we haven't had time to talk about them. And um, city manager, since you're back, there was a, a list of, of issues that are important but we haven't spent time with them yet and when when were you you were compiling that that list when do you think we'll see that thanks council member um, as I both talk to you and your colleagues um, I'm giving that information to staff and we'll have a way to present that uh, so you are um, aware of the different uh, areas that are still out there that should be talked about that's great. Yeah, some stuff we should be talking about publicly. So again, with the full information and the full impacts of, of what it is that we're proposing. Thanks. Council Member Poole, if I just very briefly, um, I think relevant to one of the comments that you made, we are Planning Commission uh, recommended yesterday, I can't remember the exact um, wording of their recommendation, but to really look at mapping transition areas more robustly around centers. Um, one of the criticisms we've received is that transition areas focus a lot on corridors but not enough on centers. And so there are some challenges that staff has encountered in trying to anchor transition areas to centers, but it's a criticism that, that we've received from, from several, several folks and from the commission. So as part of our, our map revisions that we're going to be looking at, we will be looking not only at the issues you brought up with regard to the comprehensive plan, but also in the ma at the mapping level, seeing if there's more we can do to emphasize centers, which may help to address capacity, missing middle capacity loss as we reduce around the residential corridors. So, so just know that we're looking at that as well. I appreciate that, and I'm glad that the Planning Commission noticed that too. But I, I have been raising that issue for about a year, if not longer. And so while I, I really appreciate that we're now kind of focusing on that and, and pulling together a map to address that, that situation, I am, I, I'm disappointed that it has taken this long to actually focus in on it. Um, but I am, I am heartened that others are asking for it as well and that we'll see that work soon. Thanks. Pam. Um, I have a, a couple of questions related to the um, uh, to the process that you've uh, been explaining to us. 
So, so first, City Manager, uh, in terms of um, our opportunity to talk through some issues, you know, we, we've, we've talked at previous work sessions about identifying those and setting aside uh, some work session um, opportunities to talk about that. So um, I, I'm sorry I don't have the full uh, calendar in front of me, but I understand we do have a work session on December 4th. On the 18th is our first one. I'm sorry, <coughs> so the 18th. November 18th. So how many, so you can help me with this then. How many <coughs> work sessions do we have scheduled between now and December um, 9th? I'm not sure, there's one on the 18th and then I think just prior to the public hearing on the 9th, so the first week in December, okay. I think there's one? The 4th, I think there's the one, fourth. yeah. So that would be two. I okay. think. Okay, I'm sorry, were you gonna say something else? Those are all I can remember right now. Okay, so yeah. if I so see a third and a fourth I on the here. Third and fourth. Well, what did you say, uh, Councilmember Ellis? On this, it has our 1118 Council special called work session, and then 12-3 and 12-4 also okay. have council work sessions. Okay. That would be three before the public hearing. Okay, thank you. So my, my question just is, um, and you, uh, Council Member Poole asked related to that, but um, is, it, is it safe to say that you'll, you'll be sending us some list of those topics and we will start um, gearing them up for the third, fourth, or the 18th, third, and fourth so that we can um, have the opportunity to talk as a, as a group at those work sessions? Is that the thinking? I would or say overall we stand ready to make sure that we can give the information to council, um, but I, I've heard this from a number of your colleagues that at least having an awareness of what topics are out there and to the degree that council wants to continue to dive into those, we, are, we, will, we will be ready to do that. Um, well, the 18th is the Planning Commission recommendation report. We will want to cover that, but okay. then using the remainder of the time um, we can we can work with you to make sure that we are using that time effectively. Okay, so I guess I'm really trying to get at what is the best way if there is a policy <coughs> conversation that I'd like to have. How do I how do I make sure that is that is teed up for one of these work sessions? What's the best way for us to be sure that we get on a schedule? I think. Oh, go ahead. I would suggest we go to the message board yeah, I was say and just do I'm that. sorry, what? I would suggest we go to the message board and people just identify the things that they want to make sure we talk about. Okay. Okay. And then how do we then get from the message board to the actual agenda so that our staff are prepared to speak to it? I would ask our staff to be available, to be ready to speak to anything that somebody <laughs> okay. posts onto the message board. Okay. All right. That's fine. I just wanted to have a, a route to understand. Okay. If we get inundated with stuff on the message board, then we'll deal with that then. But but assuming, you, but I think in the first place is for people just to post on the message board things they want to make sure they want to discuss, and hopefully we'll be able to accommodate as a group all of those. Okay, and then city manager, you so the list that you're talking about, when are you thinking, and how are you thinking to disseminate that? Well, I would also encourage if there are topics to put, put them on the message board. But you know, as my, as I make my one on ones uh, mm -hmm. with council members, there may be themes that get brought up, and I'll make sure to highlight those for staff uh, to also bring forward. But I okay. think the, the the most effective way to make sure that your colleagues are aware of some of the issues that you want to talk about is through the message board. Yeah, I just want to get them on the calendar. Yeah, you know, I can certainly use the message board to let people know what I'm thinking and ask others what they're thinking. But I want to make sure we get them on the calendar to talk about. So, okay. All right, then uh, Then my question about the um, supplemental staff report is I um, wanted to know what the best way is, um, let's see, uh, the, the best way if uh, I have, uh, I, I've submitted some areas that I identified that I thought were, you know, just errors, you know, in terms of, like parkland that I thought should be zoned park, for example. So, uh, but I didn't see that come out in the supplemental support report. So, what's the best? What's the best way for feedback? I know that folks are trying to help identify things that are going on with the the, the mapping. Um, so, and I know how busy you all are. But how is the best way for us to get some feedback on what we're submitting? And because I mean, there were some things that I thought I'd expected to see in the supplemental staff report and I didn't and I don't want to inundate y'all so I just need to understand what the communication mechanism is 
to go over those and understand why they weren't included. So, Council Member Kitchen, um, the the su body of the supplemental doesn't really list specific map corrections, but there's that linked document that does. Right, and they're not on that. Okay, then we will um, we will follow up with your staff. Okay. And and find out specifically uh, what parcels you're talking about. Okay. Um, and then give you a response. And it's and I, as I mentioned, that corrective work is ongoing. Uh -huh. um, so I I'm, I'm not positive the status of your of your the the issues that you pointed out but we will um, follow up with your staff and get back with you as soon as we can okay I know y'all have a lot on your plate and I want to simplify the process for you that's why I'm kind of trying to ask what is the easiest and if it's if a phone call is the easiest or just sitting down and walking through it with you if that's the easiest that's fine too I don't want to create more work I just need some kind of understanding of what the feedback Q and A, um, but we I think for for these particular parcels that you're talking about, let's uh, we'll just follow up with you informally and get you a response. Okay. The status of those tracks. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then uh, finally, I think that what would be helpful to see, and it may be it may be what you were talking about a minute ago, but um, in seeing these transition areas. Um, I'd like to to see them with the with the um, the town centers etc. overlaid on it. Um, now I heard what you were saying with regard to going back and looking at mapping more around those kinds of centers. So um, so I can I can wait and as you'll go through that process. But what I would want to see is uh, it's helpful for me to see how these relate to the centers as opposed to just um, separately like this. Does that make sense? Yes, and we the, that the map we want that map to be as useful to people as possible. So mm -hmm. we will take this feedback and, at the appropriate point, we will will produce a different map that shows not only the transition areas but the other other features that that you and Council Member Poole have mentioned and and make it as useful for everyone as we can. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Yeah, thank you for this additional information. It's not. I have. <coughs> Jillian's a question. It's not clear to me sort of what our expectation is for today. I assume that next week was our work session, and so I guess I'll try to keep my, my questions to a, a minimum today. Um, are we I think that's right. intending to spend hours here today or just very brief? Okay. Um, so let me run through them kind of quickly. One, thank you for addressing the alternative maps. Um, I know one question that came up again and again for individuals who were contemplating doing that. Um, one, I know several reached out and said they were working, they were working um, pretty actively on this, but weren't able to make it in on time. And so I hope we'll continue to accept those. As I see it, that's really community feedback that that is acceptable up until the time um, that the council has finished deliberating on it. I know one thing that that came up with a lot of people who were looking at it, the criteria were were expressed really as imperatives. I think the language was. Um, shall do this and shall do that, yet the introductory paragraph talked about it as, a, as guidelines. So I, cl I clarified, city manager, with you that these were guidelines. The language never changed, though. So I just want to emphasize that those were, as in my understanding, um, guidelines rather than strict criteria. And I mentioned in this setting one of the ones that I think caused lots of questions, and that was that the same number of properties, if you were submitting an alternative map for your, for your area, you needed to involve the same number of properties. So it wasn't an imperative that you achieve the same number of units. It was an imperative that you impact the same number of properties. So, you know, as, as I look at some of the neighborhoods like Delwood 2 and others in my area, which are mapped just darn near the 50% capacity, are proposed for rezonings. You know, to, to affect any kind of alternative map, you basically have to pick the other half of the properties, which makes no sense. Um, you know, as, as you're trying to identify properties, areas that would be more appropriate for increased capacity, you know, to allow communities to really, to provide an alternative viewpoint would, would mean adjusting that criteria. So I don't, I don't know that we really conveyed that message clearly to the community, that these were guidelines rather than strict criteria. Um, so I just, again, suggest that we continue to accept those maps um, and, and make it clear to people these, are, these were intended as guidelines, not as 
as strict hard and fast rules. I know the form itself also asked you to check off which of the criteria had been met, so that too conveyed that these were strict criteria rather than um, guidelines. Um, let's see. I have a host of questions that I'll need to ask independently, but just generally. Councilmember Poole talked about um, the question that she had submitted about capacity and trying to understand what capacity is in the transition zone citywide, um, but then to look, I mean, we've heard that number 2%, then to look at it uh, on a more granular, granular level. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Garza asked for it to be off by watershed. I asked in the Q&A for it to be by council district. In looking at the information that's coming back to us, I'm very, I'm a little confused about whether whether the answers we're getting are about what has been suggested for rezoning or what is, what is really estimated to be redeveloped as such. It, it, I believe that probably the percentages we're getting back are the latter and not the former. And so what I'm trying to determine um, is really when you look at the extent of the rezonings proposed council district by council district, within the transition zone, what do those percentages look like? And, and I want to know what the percentage of rezoning, contemplated rezonings are, not necessarily what are intended, what are um, supposed to build, be built out. Does that make, does that make sense? I, I mean, I'm looking at some of the numbers for District 9, and they just, it's hard for me to square it with what I'm seeing on a map. So my guess is that these, are really percentages that factor in how many of those properties you might redevelop and, and that relates to the capacity. I think, Council Member, that the, what you're seeing, and I'm not sure I'm looking at the same thing you are, I've got um, a breakout by Council District of transitions in R2 zones. It's, it's by zoning, um, and, I, and I think you're asking if it's something other than just what's zoning on the map or proposed build out, but I, I'll check with the mapping team, but it's, I believe it's just the zone on okay. the map. Thanks, I would like to um, sit down with one of you or have my staff sit down with one of you and really go through that to better understand it because it's not, it's not really mapping, it's not really jiving with what we're seeing on the maps neighborhood by neighborhood. Um, I appreciate all the answers that we've gotten back I don't know if there's something we could do differently for, um, in terms of linking them. I know that the first three computers I, I tried, um, both at home and here, were unable to load those PDFs. And so I'm, I'm guessing that if, if my staff and I are having trouble opening those responses that some members of the public are as well. So if we could kind of take a look at Do you at mean on the Q&A &A portal? Sorry. Yeah, thanks, okay. on the Q&A portal. Um, and, I'm, and again, I'm just accessing it as a member of the public, not going through the portal password, um, which also isn't working for me, but just, uh, just viewing it from the general public, I would, I would ask you to just take a look at those on a couple different platforms and see what's, what's going on. Can you provide some information about what specifically you'll be proposing with regard to residential transition zones? Re I'm sorry, residential streets that are being proposed for transition zones. I know you said in the supplemental port, yeah. supplemental report you're considering adjusting that. Yeah, generally uh, when we were looking at the <coughs> two to five lot criteria from May 2nd, we did not, throughout the whole city, our first draft on October 4th did not include the corridor lot in that count. Uh, so the revision will be to include the corridor lot that is residential, which will have the effect of reducing, reducing. by one lot um, the areas of our corridors that have residential frontage. Is That's there, generally the description. I know you're hearing lots of feedback about the residential street that is Duval and the fact that it is now proposed for re remapping far more than two to five lots, in some cases 12, 16, is that contemplate? Or is that something you're actively revising? Will that go back to the council directive of two to five lots? We can look at that, but right now it's using the same criteria, but counting the first lot. So uh, it, 
it will reduce some, but maybe not to the degree that you're suggesting. I guess I still need an answer in some forum about why the council directive seemed not to apply to Duval because it just exceeds, and I think there are other areas within District 9 where it also exceeds that two to five lot council directive. And so I'm, I'm still trying to understand the extent to which that happened in areas outside of District 9 at this point. I'm kind of struggling to get through the code and understand you know, what, what its impact is on the neighborhoods I most directly represent, but I certainly know that that's the case. Yeah, we, in my area. we had the question from Planning Commission as well a few nights ago, and uh, we can follow up with your staff on, on what timing that was in, in the deliberations as well as with an explanation where we showed the equity component of the number of lots in a certain I, yeah. uh, configuration to another. So, I, I have that heard that particular explanation, but I think what the public is really, what many, many, many residents of that area are asking is why it went, why it exceeded two to five lots. And, and the fact that on one side two to five lots equates to 12 on another is, has not been a satisfactory answer <laughs> to why, why we are so far out of the council directive on that. So, I mean, we can, we can revisit this next week, but, but that's um, certainly a question. Um, and then I just want to better understand the map. So this is intended, as I understand it, to amend Imagine Austin. This would be part of that. And so is that because, so without this map, as, I under, as I'm beginning to understand through this conversation, this is because Imagine Austin directed that the rezonings take place on activity within activity centers and on corridors, not within other areas. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the discussion, the um, information coming forward that you believe kind of speaks to transition zones. As I remember, Imagine Austin and the growth concept map, it was directing growth <coughs> and increased density to corridors and to those activity centers, which would put what we're what's before us out of line with our Imagine Austin plan. And so this is basically what allows for the rezoning of those residential areas that are now called transition zones. Is that right? This is what is, this is what will amend the plan because we've now diverged from what was contemplated with Imagine Austin. Um, I think that the, the, um, the text of Imagine Austin and specifically the, the text uh, around the growth concept map does discuss uh, greater density along the corridors, but we definitely felt that um, it was um, the transition areas uh, are serving a very important purpose and there are several flums. Um, there, are, there are a lot of different maps in, that are elements of the comprehensive plan and so we felt it was necessary for a variety of reasons as well as just good planning practice to really document the transition areas as part of the comprehensive plan and state specifically kind of what the effect of being in the transition area is. As I mentioned, the text uh, affirms the ongoing significance of the neighborhood planning process for rezones outside of the transition area as well as rezones uh, proposed within the transition area that would, would do, you know, anything beyond just the, the multi-unit residential that's authorized by R4 and RM1. Um, so we felt for a variety of reasons this is an important aspect of Council's direction, um, that it was important that we have a foundation for it in, in Imagine Austin. We've received a variety of feedback um, on the map itself in ways that the map can be made um, more useful to people and we certainly are looking, anticipate proposing some revisions to the map that will incorporate as well the comments from uh, Council Member Alter and Poole. Brent, so the, so the normal process would be if you wanted to, to build um, four units on a lot or eight units on a lot that currently has, has a limitation of two, you would go through the neighborhood planning process and you would need a flum amendment as well as um, a zoning change. And so this, so absent this map, 
that would be required. Absolutely, and this is, uh, I think, it's fairly, it's you know not uncommon in land use planning that you'll have small area plans that have to interact with the larger citywide plan. And so this is a, an example of sort of the citywide, within a specific area, a citywide designation supplementing and superseding individual flums, but the, the text that describes, describes that relationship takes pain to, to affirm the, the continued significance of the flum amendment process um, with respect to any proposed zoning that's within a small area planning area that's outside of the citywide designated transition <coughs> area map as well as, as I mentioned, certain kinds of rezones that would be proposed within the transition area as well. So after, so if this is adopted and the rest of the plan happens and the map changes go through, if you're in an area that's designated for transition area, that zoning happens, well, let me say if you're not, and you wanted that same zoning, you would have to go through the Flum Amendment and a rezoning process. Absolutely, and we carried forward in the draft code, I think almost verbatim, the neighborhood plan contact team provisions, which are placed in the same area as the boards and commissions section of the code, as well as the basic um, procedures for requesting Flum Amendments. Those are all carried forward in the Land Development Code. I think the October 4th staff report suggests, um, includes a, a document that sort of points the way towards revisiting area planning overall going forward, um, but, but the current draft um, maintains the existing process and the only changes are with respect to the citywide designation of transition areas. But while today those would require a flum amendment and a zoning change, basically the adoption of the map will accomplish those rezonings. The, yes, and I would just add though that the, the amendment process with respect to flums, um, if you read the description of it that's in the code, it really is geared towards requests that are made um, by applicants for individual parcels as well as citywide, or as well as council initiated or commission initiated amendments that are for individual area or sub-districts. And this is really in the nature of a, of a citywide designation that would, would sort of cross different planning areas. Yeah, I guess, I guess that's where we continue to have differing opinions because the impact of those citywide changes are very different depending on what your individual property is. And so they have the impact of, of individual rezonings depending on whether or not you're in an area scheduled for a potential transition rezoning or whether you're outside it. I mean, the impact is, is different among different neighbors. And so those are individual zoning proposals in my opinion. But anyway, okay, thank you for that information and for explaining how it would, how it would work from this point forward. Um, I think the, the conversation about centers and corridors is a good one. Um, but I think it's also important to remember that when I look at many of the centers, um, they're already, they already have fairly intense zoning um, there are some centers that are, uh, have large parts that are PUD zoning, like the Robinson Ranch uh, Center, which has some very intense um, zoning allowances inside of the PUD. Uh, I look at the Lakeline uh, uh, Regional Center, and it has uh, MU5 being zoned broadly across the, the commercial properties there. A lot of the centers are already commercial, so uh, you know, if we're going to compare um, transition zones to centers, then, then I think we would see a very different map with the types of buildings, uh, sizes, and entitlements that are going to be zoned in some of these centers when the transition zones are, are fairly small in comparison. I just think it's important to remember that. Okay. Other comments? Uh, uh, Allison? Thank you. Um, I have a number of questions that are on the Q&A that haven't been answered and that still haven't even been loaded. When should we expect to get answers on the Q&A to basic questions so that we can understand what we're voting on? Yeah, we're looking at that weekly um, at the volume of, of questions and today uh, we will be finalizing a good number of them related to capacity, which I believe were a lot of um, your questions, council member. And so uh, this week we'll be um, churning through uh, many of them that were submitted last week. Uh, and trying to keep on top of um, a healthy uh, 
production. So I have a lot of questions that were submitted before a Q&A existed that have not made it into the Q&A even, um, which we were told we're supposed to get into the Q&A. So um, a little bit concerned on that process. And I think it's really important that we get these questions answered and that they're out in the public. It's one thing for me to sit in the meeting and have you answer my questions. That doesn't help us to dispel things that are out there or to provide clarity on what's been going. And so um, the sooner that we can get some of these answered and my staff will be happy to work with you to make sure that we get those, um, that would be great. Um, I hope in the answers that you're providing that we will have access to the database for the capacity um, that is predicted. Um, when we looked at the code next draft three and the capacity numbers looking at it, um, there were some real serious anomalies on which this was based. Um, and I really need to see what those Envision Tomorrow projections are for where that um, capacity is going because it's one thing for things to be rezoned, but you know we could be looking at this data and all the capacity could be in particular areas even though we're tokenly um, rezoning it elsewhere. So it's really very important for me in understanding what this code does um, to see that capacity number in that granular level. And I know it exists because it was available um, with draft three and so, um, you know, ultimately your capacity numbers are based on that and um, we have the capabilities to do that. Um, next thing I wanted to mention was that on December 9th, four of us have a Campo meeting that evening. So just in terms of timing, um, you know, we have a Campo meeting starting at 6 p.m. So I just wanted to flag that um, for staff. I don't know what's on the agenda and I don't know whether that will be moved, but we do have that meeting scheduled. Um, I wanted to focus in on um, some adjustments and, and kind of reiterate my understanding of what's going on um, and ask for some clarification. Um, I understand that you're considering a series of potential adjustments to the code in a variety of areas that what was produced on October 4th was a draft code and a draft map and the point of the um, public communication was to iterate and improve the code. Um, I think though that we need to get clarity more quickly on what you are considering in more detail. Um, and, I, and I wanna highlight a couple pieces in particular that are of great concern to me um, that I wanna raise with staff. We've had some conversations but also wanna flag for my colleagues. So first of all, I do not believe our preservation bonus is currently, calib is currently calibrated in a manner that achieves our shared goals around affordability, preservation of existing older housing stock, and increasing gentle density with smaller units. Um, that is primarily because we have increased the FAR for the duplexes and allow an unlimited FAR for the bonus unit. Um, I would support calibration that would incentivize smaller units and prohibit units that exceed our current McMansion limits. Um, so it looks like from your presentation that changes are being considered to the FAR maximums and FAR exemptions. Can you share more about what you think needs improvement? Before I turn it over to Greg, I, I just wanna say I think that based on community feedback, we feel that the FAR needs to be more closely calibrated to increase the number of units, and so we think there's some improvement there. And we also, as signaled in the last supplemental, we think that um, the um, preservation incentive we agree with we agree with some of your comments and we think that it needs to be improved the preservation aspects of it need to be strengthened and we all also are going to be looking at the way in which um, the FAR bonus applies in, in connection with the uh, preservation incentive and we expect to be proposing specific um, you know clearly defined changes with our um, November 25th supplemental, second supplemental report. So it seems like you agree that it could be improved, particularly the preservation incentive. Um, what exactly is your diagnosis on what outcomes it is currently allowing that we would rather not see? One of them, it's not clear on, uh, it's not clear on if there's multiple structures on the lot, which one would be subject to the preservation incentive? And that is something that absolutely needs clarification. The intent of the preservation incentive is to um, multiple, but one is um, the character of neighborhoods and the primary structure that is interacting with the street. 
And so structures that are over 30 years old um, that are the primary structure uh, are the ones that are meant to um, be preserved. And so we'd like to clarify that. And uh, Greg may want to add more to that. Yeah, just that we've heard a lot about the structure being preserved and whether um, how useful it is to what, uh, what about it should be preserved and for how long and how it interacts because part of it is uh, there's an aspect to it that has to do with neighborhood character with the preservation incentive and so how it interacts with the street and whether the front facade is preserved is something that we've heard a lot about so we'll be looking at that and how much you can add to the unit that's being preserved how much additional square footage if someone wants to expand that or possibly add an internal accessory dwelling unit um, if that would be allowed. Thank you. I think this is the level of detail that we need to be communicating because people are not feeling like they're being heard. Um, from what you just said, I am hearing that you heard certain things and elements of the concerns, but the way this process is unfolding, people do not feel like their concerns are being heard and they do not understand how it will be taken into consideration. And I don't know, this is a very complicated process and we're moving at a very rapid pace, but people are not hearing that their concerns are being addressed. So I hope that we can address those things. Um, for my colleagues, part of what we're hearing with the preservation bonus is you can, if you're, if you're, if you're not hearing it from your constituents, is you, know, you can preserve one wall and you can take advantage of unlimited FAR. Uh, doesn't say how long you have to preserve it. You could be um, preserving the little tiny apartment above the garage and that counts as your preservation and then you can get a huge amount of additional space without um, the units. Um, one of the other things that I want to um, mention is um, separate from the preservation bonus. We've been talking a lot about the transition zones and that's where we're upzoning. But when we look at what is in this calibration, we are seeing huge changes um, in the single family areas. Um, and I would like to know if changes are being considered to the FAR calibrations and the FAR exemptions um, in the R2 zones. Um, and with respect to the exemptions, you specifically mentioned attic exemptions. Are you considering examining and eliminating or changing other exemptions as well? Yes, uh, we, we're uh, looking at FAR in our, outside of the transition zones in the R2A and R2B, specifically to um, duplex and other, um, and other products that are allowed in single family. And what about the exemptions? And the exemptions, okay. absolutely, yes. And in our capacity calculations, what did you assume about the increased capacity that would come in the R2A and R2B areas? I have to follow up on that. We have our um, meeting with our capacity consultants today, um, and I believe that was one a question on the council portal. So we'll be reporting out on uh, that. Because it seems to me that, given what we're seeing, could be taken advantage of by developers in those areas. Given what was put out on October fourth, which may hopefully be changing, that there's a huge amount of capacity that will come in the R2R, R2B. It could be even larger than what we're seeing. Um, on the transition areas and it incentivizes very large um, houses um, and does not, you know, in combination then with the preservation bonus creates some, some things that are very much not what I think the council as a whole wanted to see on the other end. Um, so I wanted to, to flag that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to flag for my colleagues and I had an opportunity to talk with um, the staff about is um, we need a definition of what a unit is that is not just a sink outside of a bathroom. It has to be a place where some different household is residing. Um, I've mentioned this case before. I have a case in my district where they subdivided a single family under the current code and they put up a pool house and it was counted as if it was a different household. Um, nobody's living there. There had to be no bedrooms. You know, you could have a wet bar. It counts as a kitchen. And I know that sounds like an extreme example, but there is a lot of wealth in this community. There is a lot of demand um, for very large houses. That's why we had to go to McMansion in the first place. Um, and we need a definition of a unit as a, as a, a safety break on what we're doing if we're going to be increasing the number of units. I don't know how to get to that definition, exactly what it is. 
Um, but it shouldn't be that I can add a second unit in my house that is essentially, you know, a, um, a game room with a wet bar and it counts as another unit so that I get all of these increases um, in entitlements. And I know that's not the intention, but if our code doesn't allow us to prevent that, that is what we will see. It's the same reason why we're looking at some limits on STRs. If we're gonna be creating more units and more housing, we need to make sure that we're getting housing and not um, hotel beds from that. So I just, I wanted to kind of flag that we need to um, be doing that. Um, and to the degree that you can really be being very clear about what's coming down the pipeline. I didn't get a chance to um, watch the Planning Commission last night, but you know, there are, this is a 1300 page document. Um, there are lots of different conversations going on. There's lots of different information. We don't have great models from staff at this point about what this looks like. Um, and we need some clarity on what is changing and why and how it's achieving our goals. Um, because what we saw on October 4th is the only thing that we as council members or the public can be looking at. We cannot read minds and, and it, it, it's creating um, as people catch up to this process, it's creating a lot of, of confusion and injecting um, uncertainty into the process right now. I wanna <clears throat> concur with what my colleague said. I think that you are, in, in, in your presentation, you talked about listening and, and, and you're making changes or considering changes. The sooner you can daylight that, uh, you did here today on a lot of individual topics, uh, but the more information you can get to the community, the earlier, the, the better, uh, so that people know what's, what's in play, even if you don't know the right answers. So I recognize that, that you're gonna lay all that out on the 25th, but we are meeting on the 18th. Uh, so uh, I hope next week you're able to to give us even more detail uh, of the kinds of things that are in play that you're taking a look at so that people know that they're being heard uh, and that there are issues you're discussing. Uh, again, even if you don't know how you're going to, to end up on them, I think that would be really helpful to the degree that you know how you're going to end up on them. You, the sooner you can get that out, uh, the fewer things that we're gonna have to hear for the first time on the 25th. So I would take as as much of that as you could, I think that would be really helpful. Uh, we, uh, um, um, right now, colleagues are, are looking at doing the first reading on the on the ninth. I put something on the on the board uh, that's been up now for a month or so, suggesting that uh, one approach to, to my recommended approach on how we handle the first reading. Uh, my hope is, is that that's something we'll be able to discuss at our work session on the, uh, on the 18th uh, so that we can see if there's agreement for how we should be proceeding in December. Uh, if we want to make changes to that, that we discuss those so that on the 18th, hopefully at the end of that meeting, we know what we're looking forward to uh, as, we, as we go through. I appreciate, you know, I, as I've been going around the city and talking to different groups in different places, uh, I appreciate you going back to the deed restriction question. I get that question a lot of places where I, where I go. Uh, and what we're doing in the code doesn't impact deed restrictions or enforceability in, in any way. Um, those, those rights pre-exist a development code and, and post-exist a development code. I think that's important for people to see. What about trees? Uh, are you changing, are you eliminating the uh, uh, heritage tree production? In the draft no mayor um, the changes pro proposed to the tree ordinance I think are fairly minimal um, the the there is a clarification that will be uh, proposed um, there was some language that I think needs to be added that was in the sup in the staff report from October 4th that needs to be that wasn't reflected in the code but um, the essentially there is an opportunity for administrative variances to remove heritage trees along corridors, but the intent of that is for that to be only residential projects that have 75% of the, fr of the frontage on the corridor and that are providing at least 10% um, 
on-site affordability. So it's a very limited process change that would definitely um, facilitate, make it easier to request and potentially obtain variances for, uh, for residential projects on corridors. Outside of that, the changes that I can speak to, um, again, I think they're fairly straightforward and minimal, uh, but with respect to removal of trees in public easements and public property, there is a greater ability to weigh transportation impacts. We have, you know, regulations that sort of compete with each other, and sometimes trees um, trees present challenges with respect to um, with respect to driveway placement and and um, connectivity. So there's a little bit of a greater flexibility to consider that for removal of trees on public property and easements. And then uh, the replanting requirements, I think, are actually strengthened. Um, and I can't speak in detail to that, but I think that on the whole, this is a, a positive uh, code. Oh, and the other thing I want to talk about, which rarely gets mentioned, but I think it's very important to, to daylight, is that we proposed and worked uh, with staff on a provision in the law department on a provision that is intended to basically disincentivize the illegal removal of trees before an applicant submits a development application. So in, in the proposed code includes a provision that would, if somebody, if there's clear evidence that a tree was illegally removed prior to submittal of a development application, that the development application cannot be removed until maximum levels of mitigation have been provided to the satisfaction of the city arborist. And so that, I think, addresses an enforcement loophole that we've had in the current code. And I mean, I, mean, I think there are limits to you can't render properties permanently undevelopable based on um, violation of the tree ordinance, but we can do a lot better than we have. And so I think that that's a real positive improvement to the to the tree regulations. Okay. What about local historic districts? Um, in, in some of the meetings that I've been to, uh, Hyde Park included, uh, the question arises, uh, will the design standards and requirements of the local historic <coughs> districts still apply? Uh, even for a property that has a, a rezoning property transition zone, for example. Yes, if a property has an H or an HD now, it, that is carried forward in the transition areas and outside. Okay. Uh, once every few places I go, I get asked the question about petition rights. I know you've addressed this before, uh, uh, but are there um, uh, individual petition rights to, to protest? Uh, or appeal uh, zoning changes as part of the citywide process? The law department has advised publicly that uh, peti the petition right protest right process applies to more individualized changes and not to citywide legislative um, enactments of a, of a new zoning map or a comprehensive revision. Okay. Um, I get questions about property taxes. Uh, uh, you've said before that um, the, the property code itself provides that if you have a homestead residential property, uh, it's to be valued uh, in an ad valorem tax as a homestead residential property, even if its highest and best use would be for a commercial or more dense uh, uh, residential development. Is that still your understanding in your discussions with the appraisal district? Yes, that's correct. We, and we will be coming out with information, uh, more information after a more recent meeting. I know that the tax office did come um, during, our, during the previous work on the code, uh, and we've recently met with them in the last two weeks, um, along with Ed Vanino and our financial services department, um, to understand um, a little in more depth and how we can um, provide information and communicate with the public on that issue as we as we heard through October that was a very important uh, item so more information forthcoming but that is correct uh, the homestead is the highest and best use for the properties that have the homestead <coughs> exemption that is still correct okay uh, or, or it's still valued that way even if it's not its highest and best use if it's highest and best use would be to tear down a home and build commercial on it or a more dense use it's still valued as if it were a homestead residential property that's correct. Okay. Sure. Clarify something there. So my understanding is that there's two parts to this question about the property taxes that people will experience after we make a change. 
So one is what happens overnight when you change their zoning? Does their property value change? The answer to that is no, because the zoning, the appraisal district doesn't base it on the zoning. But then there's a question of what is the knock-on effect that happens after that once houses start selling on your street that have the up zoning. And that house that sold looks just like your house, and then that affects your property value moving forward. Now you're still protected by your 10% and your homestead exemption, but the property values that you will be judged against <coughs> when the appraisal district gets to relooking stuff will be looking at that property if that property doesn't change. I mean, because when it was sold, it was still the same house type as yours, which is what they're looking at. They're not looking at what it's going to be used at next. They're looking at what it was when it was sold. Um, so I think there's a distinction here um, when we talk about the property taxes that yes, changing the zoning doesn't affect the property taxes, but changing the zoning affects the entitlements on the properties. And when you change the entitlements on the properties, you change the value of the properties. And when they're sold, they're worth more. And then that impacts um, your property if they're sold on your street. See, I hear that, but I disagree with that. And I think that's what, perhaps what we need to fill in. If the property next to me that looks just like my house sells for more, because someone's paying more for it because they can turn it into a triplex or a quad or a commercial use, and that's why they paid more for it, then that sale, even though it's right next door to me, can't be used to value my property because the highest and best use of the property next to me, the highest and best use that was taken into account in setting that value was not the value that somebody would pay for a single uh, uh, family home. They paid more for it because it had the potential to be used for a higher and better use. And what the property code says is that that kind of value that, that your property would have if someone were considering a different highest and best use, conversion to a triplex or a quad or a commercial use, is not something that is, can be used to value your property as a single family home, even though that was a single family home that sold because its value is related to its highest and best use and not to its existing use. But the only way that they know that is if it's, if it's converted into the higher use within the time frame before which your evaluation gets done. Because the appraisal district <coughs> doesn't know what somebody who buys that property intends to do with that property unless it's done. I, I would agree that, that if someone buys it for that use and never converts it to a commercial use, and doesn't do that kind of stuff with it, then that will look like, and it will be, a sale for someone who wanted to use it for that use. But to the degree that somebody pays that much in the neighborhood, and then, it, and then that person then converts it to its highest and best use based on the new entitlements, then, then sales that that value and that look like that sale would be sales that they couldn't use and, and would be what someone would come into an appraisal district when they're valuing the property and say, you can't, you can't use that. But that's not unlike lots of different valuation questions that take place in, in ad valorem tax hearings a lot when someone, a lot of times people will buy a property, pay more for it for other than its existing use. They'll pay more for it based on what its highest and best use is given its entitlements. So I look forward to you all developing that, that concept more to see if there's still issues for us to, to face. Um, Let me go Can on. I follow up on that for a second sure. on the tax? I, I think um, th this is an area that's really of concern to the public. Um, I would like the opportunity to have a conversation with the um, the tax appraisal district. The kinds of kinds of concerns I'm hearing are the ones that Council Member um, Alter is expressing, and I think we need to to get into some detail about it because what the public is telling me is 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 they're, they're taking, they're, there's a lot of complexities to it that they need to understand. And I think we need to also. And I think it's one of those areas that we can't, I, I'm not saying you were saying this, but I, I think it's one of those areas we run the risk of, of having trust issues if we just keep saying no, there's no impact, there's no impact. So I, it's one of the areas that I really would like the opportunity to spend some more time on um, and have an opportunity for us to ask questions of the appraisal district. Um, and I think it would be a good item for our work session conversation. I know we did that last time with, uh, I don't remember exactly when we did, did it, but 
I would uh, appreciate the opportunity to do that, to try to really use that time to get to the, I, I'm not going to, I have further questions about it myself, but I'm not going to get to that right now, but I would like, to, I'd like to flag that as an issue for work session. I agree. I think it's something we should spend time on. Uh, so in your conversations might be something we want to discuss. You're on, staying on this? On, on that point, yes. um, I think the, the designation of the homestead exemption is an important trigger for the appraisal district. That if a developer buys a property and it's no longer designated as a homestead property, it doesn't have to redevelop before that designation changes. And I think it's also important to, to note that you know some folks in the community have expressed concern that um, allowing a duplex in their neighborhood will reduce their property values. Um, I have started calling it Schrodinger's appraisal, that no matter what we do, your appraisal will both go up and down. And only once we do it will we know what happens. So I, I think it's a good idea to dig into it more, um, but I don't know that we're going to find any more clarity than the appraisal district currently uh, provides for its process. Okay. Same topic on the appraisal issue. Go ahead. So in the last couple of years, the, the appraisal district started separating out the value of the home structure and the land structure. I mean, they've been doing that for a long time, but they went around, they did a round, a circuit around the city and up, up valued the land significantly. And then they, they reduced the value of the, of the home. So what I think is, is going to continue to happen as the homes get older, the value of the structure is going to continue to go down. My home is a good example of that. The, the value of the dirt underneath it is going to continue to go up. And whether that's in advance of um, something being upzoned, we are talking about massive residential upzoning in this, in this code. I mean, we might as well just, you know, say that. Um, will be, uh, we will know what happens with the taxes once the sales begin and once the, the uh, comparables are assembled for um, both for MLS sales and then when the tax appraiser comes back and reviews all the activity that's gone on after these things have happened, that's when we are really going to see the changes. We're all seeing massive increases in our taxes now um, to the extent that we're all seeing the 10% cap being reached every year. Um, so, so yeah, I suppose if you hold on to your property, it's only going to be 10%, but, but it's still 10% and nobody is making 10% every year in an increase in their wages. So that's, that's where the thing gets tilted out of kilter. And it's even worse for those of us who have a lot of people who bought their properties centrally so they could be located near hospitals and uh, restaurants, maybe family, um, walkable to a, um, well, to a library. And, and so they had pitched all of their, their investment into that home to age in place in that home. And, and now they're finding that the uh, financial forecasts that they had put together for their aging in place structure are, just seem to them to be out the window. And that's what's causing so much dislocation and, dis and dismay <coughs> in the community. And so really, yes, we, the more we talk about what's going on and what the impacts are, potential or not potential, the better it will be for the community to come along. And I'll just say it one more time, we really have to have the residents of Austin coming along with us willingly on, on this ride because we are talking about their, their property. It's a huge investment, emotional, psychic, physical, uh, financial. They're invested in where they live, whether they are renting and they've been in a neighborhood for a long time or they have a home, they raised a family and now they hope to live out their years in it. That's super dislocating for our community. Um, and the homestead exemption piece is just, just one little part of it. I did have a couple yeah. more things that I wanted to bring I'll up come when back you were done. Yeah, yeah. I'll come back. I had, I had, I had one, one more thing. On the property tax value question or to property appraised value question, more question. Yes, Jenny? I mean, just, just to remind folks that appraisals going up does not automatically mean taxes go up because as the way the state regulates tax rates, it's about how much we collect. It's not about how much value there is in your property. There's kind of a distribution question if you get really into the weeds there. But especially with tax caps and other changes made at the state level, the, the tax bill changes are really not as related to valuation changes as, as some folks often, um, as, as we'll, we'll often say. Um, 
and you know the other thing is that uh, we don't always have to raise taxes as much as we have now we won't be able to anymore because of the what the state changes were but um, you know I, I've had to remind a few folks in the community about um, how votes have gone when it comes to to raising taxes okay Craig on the same question on the same question I just I, I want to concur that we uh, with Councilmember Kitchen that we should have uh, the appraisal district really lay things out because my reading and my recollection of when she was here, the chief appraiser was here, is that this state law says that you are not to be taxed on your homestead based just on the value of your home. Regardless of the value of your home, you are supposed to be taxed based on other comparable homes, regardless of the val regardless of whether you're zoned MF3 or CBD or R2. That my understanding of reading of that of that law is it's actually a change. Uh, a protection against being taxed solely on the value of your home, but instead being taxed based on comparable uses, regardless of the be highest and best use, and therefore regardless of the highest value of your home. And so I would really want her to lay that out really clearly and for us to make sure that that's um, the way that she uh, does her work and intends to continue doing her work. But okay. I, I think that that distinction is just really important. Let's bookmark this item as something that obviously we need to spend some more time as Councilmember Kitchen uh, asked. Uh, my last one is uh, that I that I hear in, in several places that I go to. Uh, if you have a single family home in a transition area and if the home is destroyed by fire or flood or if you decide to demolish it, uh, can, a, can an owner, is an owner able to rebuild a single family home uh, if their property is located in a transition area? Yes. Um, uh, Absolutely, and the, the draft code that was released on October 4th uh, does not, I think, distinguish between homes that are destroyed by accident or homes that are simply being, being leveled and, and rebuilt voluntarily. I think that is an issue that we've flagged as something that we're continuing to look at. It's something I think that Planning Commission has touched on, at least in their deliberations, as far as, like, voluntarily um, demolishing a, ha a single family home in the transition area and rebuilding it? Are there potentially some size limitations um, that could be considered? So that is an issue that we're looking at, but um, the rights afforded a single family homeowner in the transition areas are greater than would apply for just a non-conforming use, and we expect that that, that will continue um, as, as we refine, refine our work. Um, uh, so I hope that hope that answers your question. That does. Thank you. Uh, has anybody not had a chance to ask a question yet that wants to ask a question? No? Uh, Leslie. Okay, real quick. Um, on the, the tree, the heritage tree ordinance piece, if I'm understanding uh, correctly, the tree removal would be approved administratively. Is that right? Only in certain very limited circumstances. And uh, which, which ones are they? Uh, if it's a residential project that is on a corridor that has, I may slightly misstate the particulars, but 75% of the frontage is on the corridor and it's providing 10% um, on-site affordability, then it would have the option to pursue an administrative variance for tree removal. That is the only, that is the change with respect to tree removal. Does that, do, does that criteria, did the basis for that criteria come from an analysis of where our heritage trees currently are in the city? I'm not sure the extent to which that was considered, but what was considered is council's direction to sort of look at non-zoning regulations and look at the ways in which they could be modified to make it easier to do housing construction with an emphasis on affordability. Exactly. And so um, which is why people are concerned that we are going to lose our heritage trees. Um, so what I would say is that that the administ any administrative approval is not public and it's not transparent, and particularly with trees, um, and uh, our city's love affair with them, rightly so. Um, we need to look at that very carefully, and I would like to see some criteria connected with those rules about where the trees actually are, because if we are finding that some of our oldest trees were planted 50 to 100 years ago in order to line our boulevards to provide the shade, which you need in, in a hot climate, and then those are going to be inequitably targeted for removal, then, then I think we really need to have that conversation. 
On McMansion, we've been talking a lot about how we don't want to incentivize huge, huge new residential building, but I think that's what we are doing with our density bonuses. And I want to ask, what is the fate of the McMansion ordinance and the envelope that, that had been constructed in order to keep the um, uh, to keep things kind of in a human scale? Uh, Council members, so the McMansion ordinance today was largely simplified in the draft code. So we kept the, there's a, in some of the zones, there's a, what's called top of top plate, which is a certain height within a certain distance of the property line. Uh, and then as you go back towards the middle of the property, you can get more height. So it kind of steps back into the property. And then we've kept FAR for a variety of uses. I mean, the, the FAR is what's used uh, in McMansion today, the point four, but um, it's used in the new code to incentivize uses other than single family, but also to, uh, it's the leverage for the preservation incentive. Yeah, so this, this dovetails with what Council Member Alter was talking about, and I'm, I'm, I'm not comfortable with what we've done with regard to the FAR increases, and essentially you've moved compatibility onto an actual residential property <laughs> rather than, we were talking about with Code Next compatibility standards, and now we're talking about transition zones, and we've lost compatibility, but it looks like it's been relocated to the, to the back portion of somebody's property where they can go up a lot higher, irregardless of what's behind them, another, another residence perhaps. So I think we uh, definitely need to look at the McMansion ordinance and make sure that we have not done any violence to that because that would, in effect, allow McMansions to be built. We, we are incentivizing the building of really huge structures. And I thought that the city had agreed that we were going to move away from doing that. I think that is a general feeling around this dice. We don't want to incentivize massive single family homes. We would rather have a number of smaller homes. And I don't see what we're doing in this code to, uh, to incentivize that. But I'm happy to be um, uh, disabused of that. And then the last thing I wanna say is um, visualizations and modeling. Um, there are folks in the community who are, who are using the code that's out there for the rewrite and they're, they're, they're doing some 3D renderings, well 2D because they're on a piece of paper. And they don't look anything like what uh, the AIA, for example, has submitted to y'all. Those were really pretty pictures, but the other pictures of people who are doing them that maybe don't have uh, the incentive to make them look really pretty, but rather to do them <coughs> firmly and authentically with the, the data that we've provided, and I think you've met with them, some, some of the folks who are doing this, uh, and, and agreed that the drawings that they, that they came up with are in fact using the data that, that we have on the books. So I would like to see um, where they may be wrong, and I would like to see how those visualization, I would like the city to have the, these renderings. Um, I was looking on the website last night and there are some um, drawings. Sorry, so this is the staffer's name Oscar? Who was it who did the, the, the renderings that are up on <coughs> the Land Development Code page? They were put uh, up there we have a t on we have October a team 30th. At they were put up on October 30th. Yeah, we have a team. Um, Laura Keating and Lindy Garwood worked on some yeah, as well it? as others who were hired by um, with our consultant to do it during benchmark as well. Yeah, so there's a variety so of folks. Okay, well the name is listed on there for whoever who had done it and it's on the city page. What I couldn't figure out was how, what those renderings, and there were four of them, how they compared with what the residents have been putting together mm -hmm. that are similar. And I wanna see, I wanna see a one-to-one -one comparison. Um, so that we can get a better handle and be better informed on what the heck it is we're doing here. Absolutely, we can um, bring those forth on the 18th at work session as part of the agenda. If you could get them to us beforehand, that would be really good. So we have a chance to study them and look at them and see what's different and what isn't. When we get to the 18th, we're gonna be paying attention to what people are saying in our conversation, and we won't have time to upload and accommodate and have questions about the information that you're handing out to us. So city manager would be really great to the extent possible if we can, and everybody is working at 1,000 miles an hour, as are we and our staffs trying to understand what it is we're looking at so we can ask cogent questions. Um, but I would say that bringing, bringing the information to us on the 18th is gonna be too late. Okay, Anne and then Greg. Um, I think at this point, um, 
I just wanted to flag a few things for, discuss, for work session items. So um, I do want to talk, I want to dive deeper into the affordability provisions. I appreciate that we did have a, a chance to have conversations when we combined the housing and work session. That was useful and very helpful. But, um, but there are remaining questions, particularly re related to, fr from my perspective, related to how we are handling the VMU uh, requirements. And there's been concerns expressed to me uh, about the, the, the change actually ending up with reductions in what we might yield in terms of affordable housing. So I would like to dive into uh, those affordability, that affordability discussion as part of the work session. So that'd be one of the items I want to flag right now. So um, I also just want to, I do think that we do, that we need to talk further about the transition zones. I share the concern that was expressed earlier about the two to five lots. I think that, um, I think that we were pretty clear uh, in May in our direction that we were talking about two to five lots. I appreciate the, um, I appreciate the staff is trying to interpret and apply what we said, but I think we need some further discussion about how that was done, uh, potential alternatives to that. I really appreciate the fact that you're going back and looking at uh, uh, the vulnerable areas, um, because we had always said that those would be on the lesser side of that two to five, so I appreciate that. But I do think we need to have a conversation about that criteria as a whole, because um, because what we what we've seen is not an application of two to five lots, <coughs> um, and I think that there may be ways to handle that that don't that we don't have to sacrifice capacity, um, and so I I would like to have that conversation, so that's another thing that I would like to to put down, and and, and did, let me uh, let me ask one quick question: Did I hear y'all right that for the next supplemental you're going back and looking? Um, at the mapping of transition zones in the vulnerable areas, is that what I heard? Yes. Okay. Um, and those are the areas that are marked as vulnerable on the maps that we've been using? Yes. Okay. All right, um, and then I wanted to also, um, I just wanted to respond uh, to Councilmember Flanagan. I was thinking when I, when I talk about the centers, um, I am thinking about transition zones, or actually missing middle is probably a better term, around the centers, not in the centers. Because the concept behind the missing middle and the transition zones was step downs, stepping down from greater areas of density. So the fact that a, that a center is a dense area, which is what we all said we want in Imagine Austin, doesn't answer the question about what should be happening around it in terms of some of those areas perhaps having potential for, for uh, more missing middle. So, so I, I'm, I'm glad to hear, I think I heard that that's, an air, that's something y'all are gonna go back and look at, is that, is that right? Okay. That's correct. Okay, um, uh, I, concern the, I share the concerns that were raised about the, um, the tree ordinance. I think that um, we may need some more conversation about that balance. <coughs> Uh, because I hear what, what you heard from what we said in, in May. I will go back and look at the uh, language. But I think what we were tr trying to s acknowledge when we adopted that in May is that we need to look at balance. So I'm not sure if we've quite, if we've gotten to that balance yet. Um, let's see. I have concerns about neighborhood plans. Um, I, have, I have concerns about... Um, uh, about going in now and making changes to neighborhood plans in a way that doesn't follow the process that was set up for change. Uh, and that really doesn't follow it in, in any way at all. So I think that we need to rethink um, what we're doing in those areas where we have, if we have many of those neighborhood plans, and actually I can only speak, there's only one in my district, and so I can speak to that one. And that was adopted in 2014. It's a very recent neighborhood plan that the neighbors worked very hard on it and they identified areas in their neighborhoods where it was appropriate for more density. So to now go back, for us to now go back and just say, well, that was just a couple of years ago and you went through a long process, you have a contact team, but we're just not gonna follow that. I don't think that's appropriate. 
So I think we need to think about how we can balance. I, I, under, I understand that people have concerns about neighborhood plans. I think we should talk through that. I think we should talk through that as a council so we can all understand what those concerns are. And perhaps there's a way that we can find some level of agreement on what we, what we do with the neighborhood plans. Because from my perspective, it is, from my perspective, it's, it's not, I don't, I'm not saying anybody's saying this, but from my perspective, um, we've got neighborhoods that are, were inter interested in their area, that understand their area, that are thinking about where in their area it makes sense for additional capacity. And I think we need ha to have a way to hear that and listen to that within the context of the process that we've set up, which is these, these contact team processes. So anyway, I want to flag that as another work session item. And I just ask, ask us all to have, create some space to kind of think through what we're trying to accomplish um, and how we can accomplish that in a way that respects, uh, it respects that neighborhood planning process. Understanding that it's, you know, maybe it's not the same for all of them because some of them are pretty old and some of them are not. But anyway, I think we need to have that conversation. So that's all I wanted to flag for now. I'll, fl I'll flag additional things. Greg? On the uh, on the uh, message board. Thank you, and you should probably list those two, even though you went through here. Okay. I'd put them on too. Okay. Greg. Yeah, I th I think that it's important to try to use that message board thread that has been started. I and I think others have posted saying, um, uh, and I hear the staff saying that there should be modifications to make it really clear that we are incentivizing uh, more smaller homes in transition zoned areas as opposed to really large ones. So I just don't want folks in the community to think that anything other than that is what the intention of council is, if that's what was in the council direction, if that's what the staff has articulated in their supplemental report, if that's what on the message board that everybody's agreeing to, and I haven't heard anybody disagree with that. And so again, I just think that it's important that in the places where we all, we're, they were gonna disagree in this process, and that's fine, um, but in the places where it seems like there's really broad agreement, and I haven't heard anybody disagree, for us to do our best to, to, to mention to folks that that is the direction in which it seems that the council and the staff is going, which is to try to have um, uh, in disincentivize the really large unit and incentivize the smaller uh, the smaller units in the transition areas, and frankly, to try to incentivize uh, the smaller units in um, in single family areas generally, with the expansion of a McMansion esque tent um, uh, into other parts of the city. It seems as well. I do want to also talk about the preservation incentive. Um, I think we, we, we really should and need to make that work. Uh, and I think, again, that's a place where everybody's intent seems to generally be aligned, even if there might be some details where we land. It sounds like the staff's intent sounds really similar to what Council's was in May, and I think ours is now, which is we do want, um, you know, the idea of a, of a 200 square foot shed triggering the preservation incentive, I just don't think was anybody's intent, and, and that's the point of working through this together. Um, and I don't think the goal is for it to, uh, to lead to really big McMansion construction, but actually to help homeowners keep their house and, and, and add gentle density. And so again, I think that that's the intent, and I just want to reiterate that, and if anybody disagrees, I would want to hear them disagree, but I haven't heard anybody disagree with that. And so I think that that's the direction that it is we're going. But I really do want to make that work, because especially on this tax issue, as we know, the state has refused to, to have, us have a more progressive taxation structure we see valuations and, um, continuing to rise um, for a wide variety of reasons. Um, and a really good way to help folks is for them to either be able to um, you know, get, get, make more money by either renting or, or selling portions or addressing, you know, having some portion of their land provide income for them. Um, and if we can make it not just be about ADUs, but also the opportunity for this preservation incentive, I think that that's a really uh, that's, that's an area where we have more control and I really want to make that work. I want to make that work together regardless of where everybody lands on everything else. It just sounds like we're really aligned on, on those sorts of issues. And then on the, on the questions of drawings, you know, I've talked to lots of the folks, sometimes in person or sometimes online when they tag me about uh, the, the variety of drawings going around and I just uh, think everybody is, of course, entitled to, to draw things the best way that they can. Um, but I think that a lot of, of what's required in the code is landscaping and things like windows and, uh, and private street frontages and for you know, humans to be scaled on the drawings the size that most people are. And I think that it, the more that everybody, no matter what your 
preference for or against different cha code changes are, the more that everybody can make things look more like houses really would look and more like what the houses really do look like um, and compare it to the code, I just think, again, that's better for, for everyone. And, I, and I'm totally fine with people making drawings that love the code and people making drawings that hate the code. But again, just because it's such an intense um, topic and we've gone through years of it, I just urge for folks to, to not purposefully make them beautiful nor purposefully make them really scary and instead do our best to, to try to get to the facts because um, folks have brought up issues here that I think are creating change in the code and that can make this better. I, I agree that I want to look at the affordability sections, want to make those transition areas work to provide the kinds of housing we really want, really want to make the preservation uh, bonus work for homeowners that need income and uh, preserve uh, housing. So I, I think all of those things are good and I really appreciate the neighborhoods that are trying to figure out if there's a better way for them to accommodate the density in a way that works for them and I, I intend to be, you know, try to be as supportive of folks doing that work as I can. Okay. You go ahead, Pierre. But um, if I see some streets that I kind of concerned about, or the residential streets like Go Valley Avenue, where it was zoned R four, and it's just a small street that goes. I guess there's just one bus that goes through there, and I'm really concerned because those are very affordable housing there that we have, and I want to make sure that y'all take a really good look at that because I don't want to be able to. Just I, I just don't see the, the density in those little single family houses lots there in the Gold Valley Street. It, it, it's pretty much isolated from the rest of the, the major corridors. It's just a, it's a little smaller street and I just don't believe that, you know, that area, I, I, I don't know, I can't understand why it was zoned R4 on there, but if you could let me know why, what was the reason behind it. We'll follow up with you. And we did meet with the Neighborhood Association and did hear those concerns as well. And with the residential frontage, it, it will be subject to um, our revisions coming out on November 25th, but I'll follow up with, with your office on particularly why and what might be um, changed. Okay, thank you. Colleagues, it's 110. <coughs> I don't know if you wanna stay here with the Land Development Code. Uh, or if we should move to the polled items that we have. If people just want to quickly just I identify some things and then see if we can, I don't know how long people, a lot of people have pulled their own items on the, uh, on the deal. How about if we finish up with Land Development Code, I'm gonna call three people whose lights are on just to highlight your issues and then we'll have a conversation about what we want to do next, okay? Kathy. Yeah, just quickly, um, Council Member Kassar, thank you for laying out some of your issues. I just want to respond to the message board. I, I think that I have questions for you about about the comments you made. I have questions for the manager, I mean for the mayor about his suggested process. I was leaving those for next week for our scheduled work session rather than today. So I just want to be really clear that um, I am I am not I do not have the capacity to respond to everything that's on the message board with regard to the land development code. I'm doing my best just to get through the material at this point. So that's probably not going to be a forum in which I'm going to engage and let you know if I have concerns and I and I believe I do. Um, so let me just note that um, please don't interpret the lack of digging into the details and responding and engaging on, on very specific proposals in that forum as uh, as agreement. I just. I can't kind of formulate a response until I really understand better what you're, sure. what you're proposing, and, and it's just nearly, you know, it's just not time efficient to do that in that forum. So that's all I wanted to say. That I hope we can talk talk about some of those things and and not sort of come to an agreement that the message board is going to be, kind of our proxy for having those face to face conversations. Noted. Uh, Leslie, you want to identify some things? Yeah, real quick, just a response um, also to what um, Councilmember Kassar was saying about the McMansions and the really big um, residentials. In there. Yes, I agree. We're, we all are on the same page on that. The problem is that what is written incentivizes building really big residents, single family residents, because of some of the elements that are in there. And, and I think that was an, a natural outcome maybe of, of how we did the guidance document or something. But I think if we can go back and we clarify that with staff and let them know that we don't want those, um, those additional incentive bonuses in there because that's adding far for single family, that that, that will address a huge 
issue for me and clearly for, for others around here. I really am concerned about the McMansion aspect. Um, and then, Mayor, you were talking about the process for when we come back um, to do first reading. And it occurred to me because we have so many questions now. We still don't have the maps. We don't know how this is aligning with Imagine Austin. We don't have the overlays that show the 2% transition zones by district or watershed that um, I don't know, and we won't know uh, at first reading um, if the errors that we've identified have all been corrected. We won't, won't know if the corrections are correct. So I, <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to be ready, if, if we will be ready to do a first reading on under the, the scoping that you have listed on the message board. Now, when you posted it a month ago, it sounded like a good plan, and so I've been thinking about it in that form for the last four to five weeks, but now it's really clear to me that we may need to rethink it. Gotcha. Thank you. Allison, we'll close this out. Yeah, um, I had one quick question I want to get clarity. So um, the part about the heritage trees being administrative and only allowed under those certain conditions, were those conditions laid out in the draft from October 4th, or is that a new change that you're making? So I think the, the staff report describes, the, so the limitations on the administrative variance option in terms of being 75, residential projects, 75% of on the frontage, frontage on the corridor, and then 10% affordable units, that's described in the staff report, but it's not reflected in the code language, so we'll be doing a correction on that. So that was, the, it was clearly documented as the intent in the staff report, but it was just a discrepancy in the code language. The code language just, I think, says residential administrative variances are available for residential projects on the corridor, and it needs to have those caveats that are stated in the staff report. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, on the message board, I just, you know, since you posted that, I have been, you know, thinking about it, but I'm, I'm really focused on trying to understand the code, and it's till I understand the code, it's hard to understand what process I think is best. So. Um, silence on that is not acquiescence. It's just really trying to spend the time focused on understanding the code. Um, I wanted to make sure in terms of topics, um, these are things that I already have mentioned multiple times that we're talking about the FAR and the size of units and not just in the transition zones, but also in R2A, R2B, that we are covering the preservation um, incentive. In many prior discussions, I've talked about my concerns about entitlements that we're giving and how that calibration affects um, affordability, we may need to revisit that. Um, it's brought up a number of times by my colleagues about the regional centers and how we are uh, mapping for increased density around the regional centers, and I appreciated uh, Council Member Kitchen's comments that part of that is missing middle off the regional centers, which does not seem to have been mapped in, in ways it has off the corridors. Um, and then I wanted to also um, briefly talk about the models, which I've spent several hours with staff and they're accurate, the models that are out there in the community that Chris and Gina Allen have put out there, um, they are accurate. Um, we found no challenges to them to be something that could be produced by this code. Um, the issues that Mr. Kazar raises about the trees and other stuff, I just want to point out in the few, um, in the few models that we have from staff, you have similar issues of things being um, presented in ways that exaggerate what it looks like, um, perhaps in a different direction. Um, and, you know, that really just underscores the fact that we need better models from our staff that are helping us to visualize what can come out of this code. Um, it is, you know, should be something that our staff is producing, and there are very few um, that we have from that testing, um, and there are ways in which those models um, present things in a way that makes it look more attractive um, than it is. And what we were trying to communicate is not about design in these models, or what Chris and Gina, as I understand it, are trying to communicate is not about design, but the mass and scale, which is why we're asking questions about the FAR and the number of units and the preservation incentive. Um, so I just wanted to kind of um, respond with that because um, I think that we have to be appreciative of volunteers who are spending time doing things that um, we as a city should be doing ourselves. 
And I think that's good. And you're going to bring us some maps, uh, drawings, modeling on the on the 18th. I think that'll be helpful uh, because it's not only just the modeling of what can be done under the code, it's the comparison to what can be done under existing code as compared to what is out there now. Be, to be able to do the whole universe of comparisons, I think, would be uh, an important thing for our discussion. Um, so 